the Idris Shah Foundation podcast. Practical Psychology for Today. Featuring the works of Idris Shah, voiced by David Alt. Welcome to the Idris Shah Foundation podcast. In this edition of the podcast, we will hear selections from The Magic Monastery by Idris Shah. This audio has been made available by the Idris Shah Foundation. Posture Anwar Abbasi was a man of such regularity of habits that people said, The sun may not rise, but Anwar will always be reliable. When this was reported to him one day, he began to become extremely erratic. Since nobody could fathom the reason, opinions were divided but many concluded that Abbasi was in some way unwell. Then, as suddenly as he had changed, he resumed his former behaviour. Someone asked him, as delicately as possible, the purpose of his behaviour. He said, I am glad that you, at least, think I have a reason. Remember, I have many students. If I do not test their faith in me by abandoning outward show, I should be no better than a priest or anyone else who is schooled to remain silent or who is trained to make no sound. A priest is one who achieves his successes by outward appearance and by behaviour alone, though everyone attributes his accomplishments to other things. Look at the people who are affected by external behaviour. Look at the people who have given rise to priests, if you want to know whether this is for the good of mankind. The Killer As you will know, there are many kinds of bacteria. Some are useful, they help us to digest our food. Others, which have no discernible function, are quite harmless. And some, of course, cause diseases. One day, a certain dangerous bug was suddenly attacked by another and killed. A harmless bacterium standing near cried out, Murderer! This germ has done no one any harm, and yet you foully murdered it. The killer said, If it had been allowed to live, to attack mankind or even animals, it would have done great harm. It would have perhaps stimulated antibacterial action. It might have deprived us of our host tissue. The offended microorganism sniffed. I have met your kind before. Pretending greater enlightenment, you claim greater right to dispose of others. You arrogate to yourself license in the name of knowledge. I have no doubt that you are planning to kill me next. Pray direct your attention, through this instrument, at a whole caucus of your friends actually attacking a human being whom they are planning to destroy in the name of the legality of a feast for all, said the other. Do you think that I have nothing better to do, asked the offended idealist, than to obey your orders and get myself trapped into a course of action which may lead to my own destruction? All that the high-minded theoretician has succeeded in doing, however, is to teach the destructive bacteria to keep their own counsel. But neither party can really understand the other. Magician A certain Sufi took up quarters in a caravanserai near a populous village not far from Jalalabad in Afghanistan. The villagers made a habit of telling all comers about Sahir, the dangerous magician of the locality. He must be the most dangerous wizard in the whole world, they said. The Sufi called everyone from the surrounding countryside for a meeting a few days after he had heard this for the fiftieth time. He said, O people, gossip and imagination enervate the mind. I will now illustrate to you how your own love of idle talk has caused you to misunderstand Sahir. You say that he must be the most dangerous wizard in all the world, do you not? Yes, the people answered, although as a traveller you may of course have heard of a worse one, we admit that. Your magician, whether I have heard of a worse one or not, 
is obviously far less dangerous than at least one other category of magician. The worst magician in the world is much more likely to be the very one who would not frighten you at all. But, clamoured the people, what kind of magician would not frighten us? A successful one, a real one. He would have the power to do his will and yet appear to you to be an honourable man. It is only the magician who is powerless who has to make you fear him. Visitor's Information Travellers arriving on this planet will be glad to know that there is an established system of locating information and definitions, helping to clear up perplexing problems. The system is called Dictionaries. Minor difficulties, it is true, have been observed. One visitor trying to understand this thing called humanity found that, according to the dictionaries, Human means about man or mankind. Man means mankind or a human being. Mankind means man or a human being. But every minus has a plus. This visitor drew his own conclusions on what all this really meant. He based his behaviour upon it. When people asked him what he was, he said, A club. When, not finding it in their dictionaries, they asked him what that was, he said, It is a glomp. And it worked out as he had expected. One third of the people thought that he was mad, though harmlessly so, and he had no trouble with them. One third thought that he was up to something and must be dishonest, and they each condemned or ignored him, so he had no real trouble with them. The remainder thought that he was a saint. Since nobody knew who or what he really was, he was able to carry out his scientific work with very little interruption. Cheetahs and Awats A certain man had read many books on the Sufi way and after some time said to himself, This reading is useless. I must find someone who can teach me by direct methods. So he presented himself before the man who, he had been told, was the master of the age, generally known as Gilgun. Gilgun received him in a kindly manner, asking why he had come without first writing to him. I am tired of reading and writing. I want something real, said the student. Very well, said Gilgun. I shall show you the relation of reality to comparative reality. He gave orders that a cheetah was to be brought into the room. When it appeared, he said, Why do you not fear this animal? The student said, I have read that cheetahs are harmless to humans. No, said Gilgan, that we had a man here the other day who did not have this information. When the cheetah came in, he fled in alarm. It was a pity, because he was thus prevented from enjoying the advantages of cheetahs. So your reading has been of use to you, whether you are tired of it or not. Then Gilgun said, Have you ever read of the Awats? No, said the other man. I have no idea what an Awats might be. Call the Awats, said Gilgun. At that moment a frightful apparition, shaped like a man but with coloured stripes and fearsome head, rushed into the room. The would-be disciple cowered in the corner, terrified. Let this man go, and do not let him come into my presence ever again, instructed the master of the age, because although anxious for real experience, he is unable to discern that an awats is a name for a man with paint and a mask on him. Ant Research It took a certain scholar a lifetime of experiment before he could communicate with an ant. The one which he eventually found was a very wise and very ancient insect, but at the risk of causing it pain, the scholar said, Our species is immeasurably superior to yours, 
We study you, and yet you cannot even begin to observe us. The ant said, If you, poor man, only knew about yesterday, you would understand today, and also be prepared for tomorrow. The scholar confessed himself confused by such statements, so the ant continued, Millions of years ago we ants worked out what was going to happen on this earth. We knew that your species would come and ruin almost everything. So we did the only thing open to intelligent beings with complete information. We destroyed the data and forbade the breeding of ants who would understand, organizing ourselves in special colonies. Now and again we have a throwback, an ant who can see our miserable and irreversible fate. But untold myriads of heedless ants are happy, and will be so until our time comes. That is the solution for ants. You humans, on the other hand, you have not even reached the stage when you know what may happen to you, and whether or not there is anything you can do about it. Duty A certain Sufi was asked, People come for companionship, discourses and teaching. Yet you plunge them into activity. Why is this? He said, Though they, and you, may believe that they come for enlightenment, they mainly desire engagement in something. I give them engagement, so that they shall realize the limitations of engagement as a means of learning. Those who become totally engaged are they who sought only engagement, and who could not profit by self-observation of themselves so uselessly engaged. It is, therefore, not the deep respecters of activity who become illuminated. The questioner said, Who, then, is it who does become illuminated? The Sufi replied, The illuminated are those who perform duties adequately, realizing that there is something beyond. But how is that something beyond to be reached? It is always reached by those who perform adequately. They need no further instruction. If you were doing your duty adequately and were neither neglectful nor fanatically attached to it, you would not have had to ask the question. The Right Man A general riding across country became separated from his staff and eventually arrived at a small village, completely lost. The villagers gathered around him and he started to give them orders. He asked them to feed his horse, but they did not react at all. He called for a stable, for water, for blankets, and nobody moved. If you do not obey me instantly, shouted the general, I shall act against you with the utmost rigour. The chief of the village said, You don't look very strong to me. How would you do anything to us? How could you? It is not a matter of my doing anything, shouted the infuriated general. It is a matter of the chain of command. And what is the chain of command? Well, I tell the colonel, and he tells the major, and he tells the captain, and he tells the lieutenant, and he tells the sergeant who brings a squad of men. They stand you up against a wall and shoot you, poof, like that. Now you are getting somewhere, said the chief of the village. This sergeant, he really must be a powerful man. So far we've seen only you, but if we'd had the sergeant to deal with from the beginning, that would have been something. Burdens Three dervishes were asked why they opposed a certain cleric who was full of technical terms and constantly spouted involved speculations and interpretations. He drags the whole body of the matter to the feast, sure enough, said the first dervish. But who eats a whole dead body without risk? He is like the man in the fable, too afraid not to watch the door as ordered. He carried it on his back and thieves broke into the house, said the second dervish. Because he is greedy for knowledge, he is afraid of other people getting any. This is a burden which makes him unhappy, said the third dervish. If he is unhappy, 
he makes other people anxious. The Wisest Tiger A man spent years of his life learning the language of tigers. Then he made careful inquiries to find the wisest of all tigers, because the ones he spoke to were generally, to his mind, not very clever. When he managed to see the wisest tiger, he decided to put a few questions. What is mud? he asked. Mud, said the wisest tiger, coats your feet and tickles when it gets dry. And what happens in bushes? We use them for concealment. Sometimes, too, they get in the way of one's whiskers. What is man's greatest disability? Having no claws. The man decided that tigers are uninteresting, and went on his way rather crestfallen. Soon afterwards a cheetah came up to the tiger. What was that man doing talking to you? it asked. No, oh, only some stupid fellow, said the wisest tiger, who talked such trivia that I treated him like a simpleton. The Wrong Department A student interrupted a Sufi who was reciting illustrative tales of the masters of the past, and said, I intervene at this point because I need information and ask you to indulge this need, even though it may be against the behaviour of the assembly and even conflicts with the conduct required of audition. The Sufi said, We are ready to hear you, even though something raised in this manner is unlikely to be of benefit to you or to us. If, however, your need is for interrupting, interrupt us. The student thanked the Sufi and continued. My question is that we are constantly hearing about the perfection of the attributes of the masters of the past and illustrations of the wisdom and excellence of the Sufis. May we not hear something of their shortcomings and occasions where they were not able to attain that which they desired, so that some kind of a balance might be struck in the matter? The Sufi said, Greengrocers do not stock rotten apples. They throw them away. People who apply to a doctor to see his dead patients have to be sent to a graveyard. If you wish to inspect the dustbins of this world, you will have to find some scavenger to direct you to them, and we do not always learn about straight lines by looking at crooked ones, because the world is already full of crooked lines. The student has only to try to draw a straight line to find that such materials are already there within himself. Your question is one of the oldest in the world. It was in answer to it that the formula was first provided. If you want to see a crooked line, do not look for a ruler. This podcast is copyright 2016, the Idris Shah Foundation.